about our guest speakers tonight, uh, which are a combination tag team this evening, is Dr. Attila Juhok, Assistant Professor, University of Georgia, and Dr. Danielle Reeby, Instructor, University of North Georgia Gainesville and University of Georgia. <clears throat> um, I hope you read the uh, blurb that Manny sent out about the talks. It's quite lengthy as far as their qualifications go. Uh, Dr. Juha was a regional director for National Archaeological Services in Hungary for 10 years. Um, Dr. Reeby, uh, and they worked together at SN, SUNY Buffalo, Field Museum of Natural History, Chicago, Illinois, University of Illinois, Chicago, before moving to Athens, Georgia, and joining the University of Georgia in 2020. So this evening is my great pleasure to welcome both of them to speak to the Blue Ridge Archaeology Guild combined membership with the UNG Anthropology Club. And they will be speaking this evening about the Sandy Creek Nature Center Brick Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we are still figuring out how this light is not going to blind us while we give a talk. Yeah, sure. I'm going to come back to it every once in a while. Oh, I'll, I'll take that. Thank you. <laughs> it's just tea. Don't get too excited. Somebody said if you stand right in the middle, you're not, you don't have the light. No, box. Manny says no. no. Manny says I have to be over here. We already did a song and dance, so we're just going to roll with it. Okay. Um, but thank you all for coming today. Attila and myself are very excited to give this presentation to you all and to share with you what we've been doing down at... Gosh. I'm being blinded. <laughs> right. Okay, cool. Um, to share with you what we've been doing at Sandy Creek Nature Center um, in conjunction with Sandy Creek, but also with UGA students. So this is a, a really amazing opportunity for students to get some hands-on field work experience. Um, give you a little bit of background. It's interesting because as you might have already guessed, we're talking about brick factory. So we're talking about historical archeology. span And telling myself, we are prehistoric archeologists by training um, and by all the different activities that we participated in. However, we are broadly trained. So we have partaken in a lot of different excavations um, that um, encompass a lot of different time periods. Um, we have been all over the world with our projects and our interests. Um, but, um, so this gave us basically the skill set to carry out a historical archaeological project, even if that isn't really our bread and butter. Um, in 2020, Attila got a tenure track job at the University of Georgia. Um, and you can tell by like our masks and everything, twas the time, right? I, it was the best time to move down to Athens, Georgia, right in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> so we packed up a U-Haul, headed on down there, and when we got to UGA, they were like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if you guys, like, put together a field methods course? And we're like, yes, that would be so fun, but we know nothing about the state of Georgia, about Athens, about what's around here. Um, but if that's what you want, we can do that. Um, and it's still pandemic time, so um, how about we just wait and not do it in the fall? Let's put it off till the spring. So in spring of 2021, still pandemic-y, and we still have to go on with this class, even though we still haven't found a place to excavate. But luckily, we bought a house, and so we got to dig in our backyard. Um, <laughs> you know, experience, that's all you really need. Um, students learned how to do one-by-ones. They learned how to do surface survey and mapping, um, and then got that real hands-on experience digging in our backyard, not flower beds or anything like that. So don't worry. But they are on now, right? What? The, 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 those things are, are gardens now, right? They are gardens now, yeah, <laughs> sure. No, it's all backfilled and it was not part of our grandiose plan for a remodel of the backyard. Um, but in addition to the students getting to participate in the digs, our dog got to do her first archaeo dig too. Um, and she has traveled with us all over the world to participate on different projects as well. So not only is it a wonderful opportunity for students to get experience, it's a wonderful opportunity for a dog. Um, but really what we learned from this course is that getting this hands-on experience is really essential for students. And being able to provide this to them during the course of a semester um, makes it so that it's more um, available to students. Uh, most of our archaeological projects are run in the summer. And students at that time oftentimes have to get a job to pay for the next year of schooling. 
and they can't afford to go off and do field projects. But if the field project is offered during the semester, this allows students to make the most of their educational opportunities and take part in uh, excavation throughout the course of a semester. Um, and so this provided us with the knowledge to like pursue where can we do archeological research nearby in Athens. Um, we asked around with a bunch of our colleagues um, and one of our colleagues at the Arc Lab UGA's Laboratory of Archaeology, recommended that we reach out to Sandy Creek Nature Center. She was like, I know that there's ruins out there, um, and I'm pretty sure that they would be interested in working with you all. And so that's what we did. Here's Sandy Creek, it's right on the outside loop of Athens. Um, it's only about like five miles away from campus, so pretty accessible. Um, we reached out to the director of Sandy Creek Nature Center, Randy Smith, um, and he wrote back, I kid you not, five minutes later, he was like, yes, please, come day, we would love it. This would be the best thing ever. And I was like, oh, I think that we got a bite. <laughs> um, so we uh, went out and met with Randy. Um, here's a picture of what Sandy Creek Nature Center um, it looks like in terms of the demarcation of the area that it encompasses. And if you look right down here, we got the brick factory. Um, the Brick Factory has a really interesting history. In the in 1902, it was really established firmly as a brick uh, official brick company. Um, it's called the Georgia Brick Company, um, and the Georgia Brick Company goes through a lot of different radi reiterations and phases. But at one point, it's like this massive construction that takes over a huge portion of the property down down this section near the clay pit pond. That's not what it looks like today. Um, in fact, what we see is that there is a lot of standing architectural features or fallen down architectural features, um, but we don't have a good sense of everything because there's been a lot of disruption at the site. Um, you notice these buildings right there, right here. There are buildings literally on top of the ruins. Um, and when they were established back in the 1980s, they didn't need to do archaeological excavations prior to establishing the new buildings. So if you go into the um, crawl spaces of this building in particular, you're going to walk into the trackway for the brick factory. It's really interesting. So basically from 2021 onwards, and this is fall of 2021, Attila and I, with the help and support of UGA and with the help and support of Sandy Creek Nature Center, established what we're calling the University Archaeological Training Sandy Creek, UAT. Sandy Creek. So just in case you forget where you are, you have Sandy Creek. <laughs> so here's the interesting thing. Sandy Creek, or I'm sorry, the Georgia Brick Company um, has a long history in terms of the historical records associated with it, especially when we're talking about newspaper archives. Um, but the history kind of got lost for a long time. People weren't really interested in the brick factory. It kind of falls into, quite literally, ruins. And it falls through the gaps of time. Um, everybody at Sandy Creek that's working there knows that it's ex in existence, but they haven't really given it that much attention until 2015. And it goes back to this gentleman right here. In 2015, um, a guy in Indiana was going through the art, uh, was going through his attic and he finds a steamer trunk. He opens the steamer trunk and he finds dozens of beautiful original prints of some factory, some building. Doesn't know much about it, but he starts investigating. There's a stamp on the back of each of these images dating to 1911. And it has an inscription or a, a stamp that says Athens, Georgia. So he starts like, looking around, doing some of his own historical investigations and finds out that it's actually Brick Company, the Georgia Brick Company, who hired a photographer, this gentleman, his grandfather, to come in and take all these promotional photos of the site. And so we have dozens of original photos now that give us so much insight into 
the brick factory. Give you a little bit of background on what's going on in Athens at this time. This is at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Establishment of the brick company as an official company in 1902. Um, you see in Athens itself, there's a lot of changes that are going on at this time. In 1900, Athens has a population of about 10,000 people. By 1920, it's up to 17,000 people. So you're talking about it almost doubling in 20 years. That's quite a lot. And if you look at these pictures, which all date to the early 1900s of Athens, you can see that bricks are used everywhere. Bricks are used in the buildings. Bricks are used in the roads, even. You can see it right down there even better. There is a high demand for bricks. So it's not too shocking, then, that we see the firm establishment of different brick companies, including the Georgia Company. Um, and we see that people are investing in these uh, different companies. Prior to the kiln being mechanized, brick making is a very complex, difficult, backbreaking job, quite literally. But with the mechanization process that goes into these big factories, you're able to produce a lot of bricks in a relatively short amount of time. And if you look into the technological aspects even further for the Georgia Brick Company and for other brick companies at this time, you'll see that everybody's trying to figure out a way to increase and speed up the process. And we'll see that happening at the Georgia Brick Company as well. So if you are familiar with Athens, you know that we're located along the Oconee River. So we got some nice, nice beautiful, picturesque postcards that you can reference. But we also have looked into the archives along with our students um, to put together a more robust understanding and history for the emergence of the Georgia Brick Company. So here we have the Oconee River. You have the old Commerce Road that's starting to be built coming out here. Um, right up here is where the Georgia Brick Company is going to be. But you can see on these historical maps that there are other brick yards that are already in existence. And right down here, we have Sawmill too. But a lot of this land out here is agricultural land. And slowly over time, it's going to either become part of uh, the Sandy Creek Nature Center, um, or it's going to become developed in some way, shape, or form. There's very little agricultural land in existence there today. Ah, uh, here we have 1902-03 is officially the date, but 1902-1903 is when we get the Georgia Brick Company firmly being established, um, having all the paperwork signed, um, and then. The next reference that we see to the Georgia Brick Company comes in the form of another map in 1907. Here's that little loop, -de -loop that we see on the river of the Oconee. And here we have Georgia Brick Company right off of the Sandy Creek offshoot right there. Um, firmly established on the maps by 1907, but you can also see, oh, what's that? Competition, another brickyard. <laughs> we don't know much about it, but we do know that there are other brickyards that are nearby um, because again, that demand is there. In 1909, we get more references to the Georgia Brick Company in the different um, newspapers for Athens. Um, we see that there's references made to uh, how much uh, brick is being produced. That's a big thing because they're trying to draw more interest into the company. They're trying to really get more investors to show up and shell out. Um, they're trying to get people to um, buy into the system. So when they get this new system, the Martin system, they want to advertise it to people. They want to put it out there like, look at us, we're utilizing new technology in order to mechanize and improve and speed up this process. Not only are we using the Martin system, but we're also using the boss system, which let's be honest, sounds really cool. Okay, so that system seems to attract some people. But in 1911, they get another process and a new technology that's going to be incorporated. And that's the Shaw method for processing and producing bricks. The Shaw process is sold to the company in 1911 by an individual. But um, to put it out there, it turns out that Frances Shaw, she's a good seller of goods, but the goods themselves ain't that good. Um, so she's kind of considered to be a common woman who goes around creating all these different patents 
and then selling the patents, making a lot of money, running out on like hotel bills, but I digress. The important thing about all of this is that Francis Shaw um, really sells people on this Shaw method and generates even more interest in the uh, Georgia Brick Company. Uh, and honestly, it gets more people to invest in the company. They're saying that at some point you can generate 60,000 bricks a day, which is amazing. With the Shaw method, what she's talking about here is providing the um, opportunity for bricks to be on a continuous mechanized rail. One continuous rail that you can put a load of wet bricks that have been dried, I suppose. So dry <coughs> molded shaped bricks can go into the kiln, be fired. And then you never have to like turn the kiln down. You can just slide those bricks out and the next set can come in. Because most of the time what you see occurring with a lot of these um, uh, kilns is that you have to turn them off and then turn them off. And that takes time to heat up those kilns and then a lot of time to cool them off. But if you can mechanize it so that it's all one seamless process, well then you're making money and bricks. Unfortunately, the Shaw process isn't all that it seems to be, and there's some issues. And by 1913, 1914, we start getting all of this newspaper clippings about how there's bankruptcy proceedings according, or that go along with the Georgia Brick Company. This isn't good. Um, people want their money back, and they're not seeing what they were promised, right? So the Georgia Brick Company goes through a, a little bit of a nosedive, if you will. It gets worse. You think that's bad. The company does stay intact. It's being utilized, though it's not producing 60,000 bricks a day by any means. But in 1922, there's a fire, a mysterious fire. <laughs> People say it wasn't their fault that there was like a spark in the engine room that caused a fire that burnt the whole building to the ground. Unfortunate. So that begins the end of the Georgia Brick Factory, unfortunately. Um, but the owners of the Georgia Brick Company, they do go on to start a new company, the Brick and Tile Company. We're still investigating it, and students this semester have their own individual project that are um, that's looking more into this. Hopefully, we'll have more to share the next time we present. So, what happened to the Georgia Brick Company? Well, after it burned down nature took over. As you can probably imagine, it was pillaged quite heavily. Um, people went and they like scavenged around taking the parts that they could. There's a lot of metal at the site. Um, there's a lot of nails at the site and people want to utilize those. Even if there was a fire, there's still going to be materials that can be scavenged and reused. Um, and then as slowly and slowly nature takes over, um, and then you get the development of Sandy Creek Nature Center and the establishment of different buildings. Again, it kind of, the brick factory itself kind of falls into the background of people's minds until this guy, until we have the images that he finds, or that um, the gentleman found that his grandfather took in 2015. I'm going to share some of those images with you because I think they're that important and that powerful. Um, here's the clay pit pond that I was telling you about, and you can see how it's being dredged to get some of that good Georgia clay in order to be making these bricks. Not only do we have lots of shots outside um, showing the clay pit pond, you can also see this ramp that goes from the pond up and then over into all the uh, buildings, including um, the auxiliary buildings. And it's on a mechanized uh, ramp over here. And you have a, a pump right there that's going to be helping to bring everything up. Um, and everything, all the clay goes right into here. So these are bricks coming up that? They're not bricks, they're uh, mud. They're just up. mud. So we got that raw Georgia mud right okay. down here. So mud's being come uh, is is coming up from the clay pit pond. It's clay. I'm sorry. Mud sounds so oh, bad. Yes. It's clay. It's that clay. good stuff. Clay. Good clay, clay that's ready to be made <laughs> into bricks. Um, so then once it gets to that first building, that's one of the first processing buildings that we have. Um, and it's going to eventually be cut into, molded and then cut into bricks. And then eventually it's going to come on down the line and go into the kiln. 
this is the end process. This is all cooling areas. And then out here, all the cool bricks get loaded up onto the carts. There's a train track right over here. So they can either take the old Commerce Road or you can put a load onto the train tracks, send it on down, or onto the Coney for that matter. We have lots of pictures showing the inside of the uh, different parts of the factory as well, showing you like different engine areas, showing you that um, mechanized system where it's on this um, like track system where it's going through, going into the kiln, waiting to get fired. Here, ah, got Mrs. Francis Shaw right there. Taking one of those promo picks. <laughs> um, here's that brick that's coming out the other side now. Already processed. Here's the one that um, I know this one's kind of hard to see, but we have this gentleman over here, and you get one continuous like sheet essentially of molded clay that's being cut into sections for bricks. And we have lots of pictures of different workers too. And you can see we have African-American workers, we have Caucasian workers, we have a diverse group of individuals that are working in this factory. Not only do we have these pictures, we also do have um, different historical documents that note their work at the site. And then of course, I'd be remiss if I did not show all the pictures that we have of Mrs. Frances Shaw at the site. Um, she is an interesting charlatan who has a very complex history, but I'll leave it at that because I feel like it's a whole different talk and we have so much more to get to today. So like I said, the site itself is quite different um, and I will pass it off to my co-director for the project. You've got this. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Can I ask a question before you change? Um, so it's a great idea. It just didn't work. Um, and I don't want to step on your toes, but I have to say that the bricks that were being produced here were not very high quality bricks. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. I'm sorry, hand off to the. Okay, <laughs> just kidding, we didn't work out here. <laughs> okay, hi guys. Uh, let me continue actually with first a, a short overview of how the site right uh, now looks like. Okay, because you want to know that. So basically, you know, everything is in ruins. Uh, this is a trackway right here. I'm going to show you other pictures. That's basically the structure that Danny was talking about that was built right top of the ruins in the 80s. So it's pretty obvious that this is a trackway again that, well, they might have, unfortunately, destroyed some parts of the site. But, you know, it was unintentional, I should say that. And, you know, this is the clay pond, uh, home of beautiful water birds now. You know, you also can fish, so it's a really nice area for recreation. Uh, and uh, this is the lighter image of the area. I'm not going to get into it, but you can see basically the scale. So this is the clay pond, and this is our little thing, our little brickyard right here, and this is the old Commerce Road. So when we started this project, we wanted to figure out some meaningful questions, right? This is an anthropological department. It's not a history department. It's an anthropological department. We want to learn about people, right? We, them definitely want to just focus on, for example, technical aspects or, for example, the history of the building, how it changed over time. I really wanted to know more about the people who actually worked there. So we tried to learn about these people because this is what we are trying to do. In order to do so, you're going to have some material correlates of their life at the site, of their work at the site. So basically, we wanted to focus on those areas where different kind of communal activities might have occurred to learn about people's life who were there, right? This is anthropology, again, not history. Well, uh, you have seen a lot of photos. Uh, they're beautiful, fantastic resources. But all, most of these photos were taken from, from, were taken from this direction, right? So basically, this is the western wall of the structure. So most of the pictures were taken from north or northwest. So we know a lot about, you know, the ramp, we know a lot about this side of the building, some about this side, but we know almost nothing about the so-called southern side. So this is northern side, western side, southern side. 
So we have no idea what was really going on there. So this is one picture, and there's another one where you can see something. Well, what we definitely know that in the, in the northern side, north of the building, there's nothing, there's not a single structure that may be associated with actual communal, communal activities. It's all about making work. So where if there was any structure that may be associated with uh, these communal gatherings of, of the workers, that might be located actually on the southern side, where there's zero, basically zero information about other than the NG room that, that was mentioned before. Right? This may, might have been the NG room. Well, you know, it's kind of like we have to come together in the NG room, right, to, to have that lunch. Very likely it didn't happen there. So, so, all right, so that's, you know, our major question, how basically workers lived there and worked there and hung out there. So, Okay, let's just find the material correlates. Let's just find structures or anything that can be associated with these with these uh, uh, activities. Okay, so you know we are talking about archaeology. Archaeology is about digging, partially uh, because digging is expensive and it takes a long time. And you want to dig at the right place, right? Not at the wrong place. If you want to know more about the communal uh, uh, areas, you want to focus on that and not the engine. So. In order to do so, before you would start excavating, you can do and should do some preliminary research in order to find the right spot, the right spots to dig at, right? You might have heard about you know, these issues. So one of them is the so-called survey, uh, basically. So what we do in a country which is beautiful and well-known, oh, what happened? Oh, Zoom too fast. Oh. Go back, the other way. Oh, oh. That's not good news. No, it's not up and down, it's side oh, side. Sorry, that was my bad. Uh huh. Uh huh. Oh. <laughs> so, in a country which is so beautiful because it has a lot of Ohio like landscape, right? Super exciting. The good thing about it, though, that we have a lot of plowed lands, right? So, you can go to these plowed lands, like good 80, 90% of the plowed. You go there at the right time, and you can basically, you can, you can basically pick up artifacts from the surface. You can, Map sites, find sites, map sites, the spatial distribution is clear, right? For example, right here, we are having fun with my buddy. These are, you know, you know this is the not, not the sharpest uh, image, but these are big chunks of beautiful ceramics, like 7,000 years old in that case, right? So that's the normal way, right, that you would do in my little country. However, you know, we are in Georgia, so the situation is a little bit different when it comes to visibility, because you've got to have good visibility in order to carry out surface collection. Visibility is an issue in Georgia. <laughs> and this side, this is how it looks, right? So you go to the go to the go to the, 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 the side, and you know, as opposed to this beautiful plot land, here you can see zero nostril, right? Still, we gotta deal with this somehow. So what we did first, we definitely wanted to map what's going on at the side on this southern uh, uh, end of the site. So we did that, well, we have fantastic students. What they can do really well, they can rate, right? They also can collect. You don't need to have, like, expertise on that. You can just do it, just you know, use the rate. Some some just learn how to use rate. That's fine. That's, yeah, that's no problem, right? It's okay. You need to teach them a lot of skills. So it's all right. So what we did, you know, we, we basically rated the area. We cleared off the foliage, that's, that's what happened. We collected it, then dumped it in another place. And look at that, how good these guys were. Yeah, now we have a surface, which is quite good. You know, visibility is quite good. So that's fantastic because this is exactly how we can start surface collection in order to understand what's going on in the area. Just get a general picture, uh, picture of the spatial structure. There may have been a building, there may not, you know. The surface, uh, the surface finds and also some surface features can inform you about subsurface, subsurface features, right? That was the idea. Well, in a normal case, as I mentioned, uh, you pick up all artifacts, each artifact from the surface, you know, in a, a very controlled way. Uh, I'll talk about this controlled way uh, soon. So this is what you do. You pick up all the artifacts. The problem here that, well, this is how the surface looks, right? So it's like just full of bricks, like, like, Broken bricks. Well, you can collect them, of course, from the surface, but you're gonna buy like a huge storage room for it, right? And you're gonna deal with it. That's that's what you cannot really do. But what you can do, you still can map, right? You can still can map. You can identify 
concentration of different kind of materials, also different kind of uh, topographical changes that may refer to features, and this is exactly what we did. So we did, we used uh, a grid system. Okay, so now you will see the grid system here. So basically, you can see this line, and there's another line here, there's another line here, another line there, where the pin flex are. So these are five by five meter collection areas, or in this particular case, mapping areas. So what we did, you know, we mapped the entire area, basically. We mapped the entire area in order to identify those concentrations, what I mentioned, concentrations of bricks or concentration of other kinds of materials, also changes in the topo topography. Because many times, what you can see, is we have like these little bumps and smaller bumps, and why is it not going? I don't know what's <laughs> happening with this. I don't know, it said something it's, like it's, it's, oh, yes. will. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Oh, oh, go ahead. It's just useful to have them some slides. It's oh. easier. Oh, oh. The froze. Oh, it? The froze. Oh, it's too much. See, animations. You broke the animations. The animations. <laughs> <laughs> the animations. This is intermission, you guys. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Does it work with your clicker? Let me see. Uh, yeah, uh, there it's working. It's all right. Thank you. you Thanks so much. So, yeah, so we have like these, these micro changes in the top of the We have like Ridges at the side, so we also could map those because they can actually refer to, for example, buried walls, right? They are not there anymore, but the little ridges would actually show where it was. So we, we systematically map uh, the site, and uh, that, you know, students are using beautiful, fantastic uh, tape, uh, tape measures, and they, 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 they did the job. Thing is, again, what we do here, we train students, right? So they need to do it, you know, of course, you know, mapping, and also surface collection is kind of like organic parts of any archaeological projects if you especially focus on settlements. So they were learning actually how to map uh, spatial distributions at uh, this site. Also, you know, they also drew maps. Mm -hmm. So this is a five by five area, right? And basically this is a kind of like sketch map using those measurements. They drew up, uh, they drew up maps, they had another skill. Well, you know, that was the surface mapping. You know, we collected a lot of information about potential features. However, you know, we still have some methods, non-destructive methods that can be used before you would actually start digging. And one of them was a ground penetrating radar. Uh, really shortly, ground penetrating radar can identify and map subsurface features. Basically, we are talking about radar pulses and it measures those radar pulses and eventually you uh, end up with a beautiful map, right? You end up with a beautiful map of potential subsurface features. Uh, okay, then this is how it works. Look at that. It's a little bit slower than this, you know, but <laughs> that's, that's how it works. Well, it's kind of like a painful process because, you know, we are in the woods uh, and you can actually use these straight lines, like, like uh, space, uh, space apart. Well, eventually we did it on another problem. So basically, we uh, measure two areas, and in these maps, the, the blue ones, we don't care about that, because the blue areas are actually the, the, we care about them, but they are not features. But we have the yellow, the yellow to gray, I'm sorry, the yellow to red areas, and also the gray areas, which may be features, right, which may be archaeological features. So the, we are interested in those ones. So we have now the surface maps, right? We have all these like spatial distribution of artifacts on the surface. We have this information. It's faster to look at this big so-called anomaly that may be something a large feature. Uh, we are pretty well informed. However, what we did also with the students, we used another method, a uh, so-called magnetic survey. Magnetic survey works in a way that it actually measures spatial variation in the Earth's magnetic field. So if there is human specific kind of human activities, the Earth and, uh, mag Earth, the Earth's magnetic uh, field would be distorted, right? It would be changed. And basically it, it measures the variation. If something is not touched, you're going to have this magnetic force. If something is touched by humans, it's that simple. It's going to be like this. So you can map those areas which might have been affected by humans, by humans, by people. 
All right, so now we have, you know, this image here, the same issue. We might have features in this area and this area, probably not much here. So these are like really big anomalies. And actually the data which came from the GPR, ground penetrating radar, and this magnetic survey, they match pretty well spatially. All right, so we are good to go. We also have this uh, surface, uh, uh, surface uh, mapping uh, information. Now we can actually start excavating. And this was taken, actually this picture was taken today. So we focused on a specific area and started opening one by one units, one by one meter uh, excavation units. And those excavation units were put or were placed on these anomalies, right? That you saw before, the GPR and also magnetic anomalies, and also in areas where there is nothing on the magnetic map or the ground penetrating map, just to see what is the difference between the, 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 the various areas. So we started with one by ones, how many years ago? In 2022. 2022, right? It's 2024, so it's not that many years ago. So these are this our third good. season. And you know, we started with these one by ones, and in several cases, like in this case, we started extending also these one by one units, one by one meter units, in order to expose larger areas where the results were interesting. So for example, here, there was a beautiful surface, beautiful hard surface that we could follow, and we wanted to understand what surface it was. Did it belong to a building? Did it belong to a yard or, 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 or what? what happened? And this is exactly what we are excavating right here. So, and uh, some features just to show you guys, uh, uh, that's from today, I took these pictures today. Uh, we found a really interesting, again, we have a one by one unit here, uh, a, a part of a one by one unit here. So basically what you can see, oh, sorry. What you can see here is a concrete, the edge, the edge of a concrete structure. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, that's, why interesting. This uh, trench is located about like two meters from this one. So this is zero plus two meters apart. Well, today we exposed finally uh, a part of the same concrete structure. Well, you know, we had no idea uh, when actually this structure was built. So we are a little bit kind of like skeptical if it belonged to the precard or not because look at this we have like this kind of like what cap i would say i don't know in what it is if it's a cap or not if so it's yeah. cut into the concrete so oh, very oh, likely oh, i mean yeah. we don't know yet if it yeah. dates back to actually the brickyard or it's associated somehow with the new building but you know for students to excavate it and document it it's just perfect run then you know, eventually we will figure it out when we open actually this little little thing if it's a treasury, <laughs> a basement, or a septic tank? Or a septic We don't know yet. You know, I, I'm trying to argue against a septic tank idea because, you know, who would put a huge concrete cap on top of it? It's like you cannot really do it, right? They did it. They did it. Yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 people do it. Yep. Well, well, Hungarians did that too. So, welcome to the Georgia. One of these law of rules in archaeology is the neat thing's going to show up in the corner of the square. So yeah, on the last day, because that was, that was our last day. Yeah. Yeah. That was the last day. Always, always, always. what it is. Yep. <laughs> always, always the last day. So, but at least we know about it. Then we will figure out what it is. Now we've got to do some, some archival research in order to understand if it can belong to the current building and built in. We've got to call Randy. So, so we got more it's in the corner. Yeah. Uh, uh, is that a handle? Mm. It's metal. It's wire metal. Right. Yeah. Top of cover. Treasury. 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 That's it. All right. So this is one of the interesting features. However, it was really good. The students love this. It's like they got so excited that finally, after so many weeks. They are finding something that is a feature. They, they're going to be, have some findings. But again, it was something that excited the students. And, and that's, that's one of the goals, right? To make, make them excited about art. Another real feature for sure, that's super interesting, you know, that's a profile. Uh, we love profiles, okay? So we, we, because we can actually 
put up beautiful stories using only profiles because we have really good, <laughs> usually really good uh, oh, yeah. uh, mind for that. So basically, you know, this is a profile, this is a current surface, right? This is a room right here. And this is the bottom of the profile. So we have like this, this uh, yellowy uh, clay. Then we have the beautiful the clay on top. And we have this black little layer, like a really thin layer with a lot of burnt uh, coals. So a lot of burnt coals, very likely actually represented the burning episode. Yeah. And it's quite far. It's quite far from the building. It's like, no, okay, yeah, I, I got to use feet. All right. So we're like 45 feet away. Let's just say that from the building. So it seemed that a pretty huge area was impacted by you know, this burning episode that happened in 1922. Mysterious. So there's another feature that and we could identify the same one, the same strategy with the, the, the black layer in other trenches too. So it's super cool. I really, really love that. Mm -hmm. Another feature that is interesting is maybe may, may another feature may be associated with a burning episode itself. So what, when we did this uh, surface mapping and you know also just walking around the side, uh, we saw these these really heavily burned, what we call vitrified bricks. Mm -hmm. So like really high temperature uh, causes this kind of like vitrification. You know, this is one of the worst, that I, it's really hard for me to pick, but it'll buy now, like really good at that. <laughs> so it's like highly vitrified, highly vitrified. They just, it's not just brick, because you know, you know, if it's just one piece or two, it's like, yeah, they screwed up the, 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 yeah. the burning process of the, of the brick itself. But we also have actually agri agriculture, uh, architectural, elements like like bricks together like from a from a column and the entire structure was exposed to this really really high temperature and that's why you can see this vitrification high degree of vitrification i'm like okay so that's quite interesting why don't we actually open a trench over this area just to learn what's going on there it's in its infancy, 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 yeah, infancy, 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 so it's very likely, no one knew where it really started, probably a spark in the, in the NG room, uh, but no one really knew. And it seems based on the current archaeological information, it's not evidence yet, but the information, that actually, it what really started here. What you need to know about, yep. This is a steam engine, right? Yep. What, what causes a spark in a steam engine? Nothing. There's actually electric, electricity out there, too. Oh. There is okay. electricity. Well, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so you so there's an oil... There's an oil rig right there. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Um, so this was there's oil, electricity, and quote unquote steam. But steam is actually a steam. Uh, the the they they're, they were using a bo uh, electric a boiler. boiler. It's an electric boiler for the mm, steam. Thank you. Actually, you know, it's, it it was not rare. Let's just say that when it comes to like these, these steam engines, they they tended to explode. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so that was, was, that was, was another thing going to the, the intense fire. A lot of this building wouldn't building a, a built with pine, mm -hmm. and when pine dries out, it burns very hot. Oh, yeah, yeah exactly. and that may be part of your expectation. Exactly, exactly. So, so we think that we could identify where the, the fire starts, and you know we are again, you know, it's, we are in it's uh, it's very it's very beginning in, in the beginning phase. Starting phase, yeah, something like that. Okay, and you know, this is how it looks. So it's just all these piled up bricks, you know, currently we are working on kind of figuring out, you know, what's beneath uh, this rubble on the top. And look at that, Robert, just found, you know, these very nicely uh, 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 lined, lined up bricks. So probably we are going to find something uh, in original context and we are working on that next year because, you know, that was uh, the last excavation. Day. So what well, we also have some findings. I'm not talking about that, uh, like, like a museum full, uh, like case full findings. Like the amount is still pretty moderate. Let's just say that you know. But uh, happy, but it was just, of course, a broken pipe. Uh, then you know, let's just see. Oh, it was here. Other finds include this fantastic 
Uh, oh, bolt, oh, exactly. Oh. Uh -huh. Married with a wife. Oh, so that's, that's, that's a nice little piece. And we also have some glass pieces. Uh, uh, also have, of course, as Daddy mentioned, nails. Uh, uh, not a lot, but again, it's still material culture, uh, and we hope to find more in the future. Also, what the students learn, and it's super important, documentation. Because archaeology is not much of different for difference from looting if you do not document this, right? It's just looting. If you do not document uh, your features, your findings properly, then you're not better than looter. So, so they need to learn that. We have different kinds of beautiful forms. I'm not going to, I'm going to explain the different forms, okay? <laughs> so what we created specifically for this project, of course, you know, they need to take photos uh, and they learn how to take photos, what they need to do in order to photograph features, different features and, you know, entire trenches. And also they need to learn how to draw uh, their uh, 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 trench. Well, you know, there are more and less talented uh, drawers. Let's just say that, you know, this, this person was more talented than I am. Okay? But precision, what matters? Okay? Precision, what matters? Other than that, you know, you can be really bad at things. It's like drawing like me. I stopped and basically developed when, when I was like, 10 years old, and it just never changed. You know, <laughs> I had that kind of skin. No problem. All right, and you know what's going to happen, and this is what happened in the past two years. Uh, we will wrap up. Wrap, wrapping up means that, of course, we will meticulously document the final phase, so, or the final, sorry, final state of each excavated trench, right? Then, of course, we use tarps, then we backfill. We backfill always our trenches for many reasons. Uh, one of them is that you, you don't want people to actually fall in these trenches. Second thing is like if you leave it open, uh, then in a year with all these like like heavy rain, they would erode. They would, would, would probably even find your trench. So you want to protect your trench. That's what we are doing uh, starting next week. Uh, also, uh, what we need to talk about like uh, really briefly uh, uh, that uh, Danny already mentioned that you know, this, this kind of class is pretty rare and it's a great opportunity for students to actually uh, gain a lot of experience in many things. And, you know, I'm just showing you some, some examples. Uh, and, you know, these experiences can help these students eventually to find jobs, right? Yes. So if they have some knowledge, you know, you can actually, based on that knowledge, you can improve, uh, but you already have like a good basic, basic uh, level skills. Uh, and it includes, for example, how to, uh, operate a total station, right? A total station in order to measure uh, points at the site. Because, you know, we are working in a 3D world. X, Y, and Zs are very important because context is super important in our uh, Also, you know, they, they, need, they learn how to fill out these forms. They learn how to use this Munso soil chart, which is like a magical thing because it's all about uh, basically uh, record different kind of colors that you can actually see during your excavations, and and you know it's like just just a, I'm not going to delve into details. It's just you know one of those those interesting things that uh, they can do, and uh, everyone uses actually archaeological excavations. Also, uh, at the site, as we mentioned, we have these uh, buildings, these structures built in the 1980s, which you know kind of said that they were built, but you know they're there, we're using them. And uh, we have a classroom basically out on the site, not at the site, on the site. So, you know, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity for us and for the students uh, to, be, uh, 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 to be there, not just excavating, but also we have a fantastic classroom. And, you know, we can have, you know, these introductory lectures, for example. Uh, oh, uh, office archive tour. I don't know what it is. Can see a picture? Hold up. Did you actually have lab yeah, okay. sessions in there? In oh, that oh, okay. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, good, yeah, good. So also students have other reporting. They also can learn a lot about wet Georgia clay, right? Mm -hmm. This is what they were doing this morning. Right? They, were, they were really learning what the soil is here. Right? Mm -hmm. And another thing that they also can learn uh, is, you know, as to add another sort of, sort of student, uh, student opportunity that Danny actually baked cookies for them each time, <laughs> for each class, two different kinds of cookies, <laughs> and the students, and the students read them. So we have a, what is that, group? We have an Instagram, and the Instagram. students rate the cookies every week. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> what an opportunity for students to have beautiful cookies, right? That's, and also, they also have an opportunity 
well, to pet our dog. Uh, but I got to tell you that, well, she is not, how to say that? She's a not an emotional support animal. Not an emotional support animal. She's like a like very low to moderate level friend. She, <laughs> she wouldn't bite you, but she's just not interested. She loves being out. Yeah, she's not interested, but you know, they are again, you know, these are, these are other fantastic opportunities for students to actually take care of something. In this case, this is our dog. So, what's next? Uh, we are going to have an open lock house, lock house day this uh, uh, Saturday, if I remember correctly. Sandy Creek is having. Lock Sandy, house. Yeah, exactly. Sandy, Sandy Creek has this uh, annual lock house party. And during that, we are going to have this open session. People could come and see how we are excavating, documenting, and doing things at a site. So you're uh, cordially invited. In other words, never used, cordially invited for this uh, opportunity. Then, you know, we have the backfilling day. If you want to backfill. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we definitely will provide you with a show. Do, do we get cookies? <laughs> Yes. Yes, you do get cookies. <laughs> yes, definitely. And then at the end of the class, we need to actually backfill now because uh, the, the last two classes is about presentations. One class. Last the one class is about presentation, student presentation, because the students actually have their own projects mm -hmm. associated with this side. For example, there is a genealogy group, it's like two, three people we are talking about in each group. Genealogy people who try to identify the workers and try to actually uh, figure out what happened to them and their family. Their you see and so on. Or, yeah? Is the student presentation going to be at Sandy Creek? Yes, yes, but you know, it's, it's, it's classic, but if you're interested, I can find a seat for you. find a seat for you. <laughs> And a shovel because probably. It's all right. Uh, to learn more about you know the spatial distribution of that vitrified uh, uh, bricks. Also, there are like big plans, not by us uh, really, but the park itself. So, for example, different kind of signages based on our excavation results. And also, of course, we also have this historical archival research that we are doing. So we are helping the park and the park is going to use the signages. And there's this idea of which can be familiar. Which movie was that? Michael J. Fox? Back to the Future. What? Back to the future. No, it's not. It's okay. Uh, so you know, when, when you have the see-through, see-through plan and see, sorry, see see-through image uh, uh, through which actually you can see, you can see how they procured the uh, use to the line. And this is our Instagram. This is our Instagram. That is our Instagram. This is our Instagram. Questions, guys. If you'd like to follow, yeah, sure. click on that puppy right there. <laughs> Did you guys uh, use metal detectors at all? Would that have helped, or is there just too much metal out there? Yeah, there's there's too much metal, so it, it really makes it's just like it would be like beep, 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 yep. beep, 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 beep. So yeah. even even the magnetic survey was questionably productive because you know if you have a lot of metal, that metal can metal can screw up you know your 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 uh, map. But for some reason, Mr. Estreza, we could use a filter that basically could filter out these noises uh, caused by caused by metal. Yeah. Any other questions? What about it? Do you ever find any Native American things there? Just or was that ever part of that area? Yes. Site? Um, so we have not found any Native American remains, right. but there are um, in that location or not. In Sandy Creek Nature Center, the broader park area, there are uh, Native American uh, remains, or the not like settlement remains. So by that, you'd find yeah, there's there's evidence for Native American settlements out there, okay. but not where we are located, and we um, have not found anything to suggest that. That's it. Well, the area you're working would have been so disturbed by the brick making that there probably wouldn't be anything. Prehistoric, it was still in place anyway, was it? Probably not. Very light. Yeah. 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 It was like intensively used the area yeah. during the early panic century. Did yeah. you uh, utilize the Sandburg map series? So we did try, but we have not found one for this. 
for the, I know, for the Drapeford company, you know, students looked for that. So the Sandberg maps are the fire insurance maps, yeah. um, and they did try to identify it, but they have not found. Or the Georgia Brick Company. I it's really told them. It's just too far out of town. Maybe it's too far out of town. Maybe they didn't, maybe they registered under a different name and we don't know. Um, but yeah, we have not found it. That would have been really nice. I, I remember somebody else talking about that and that like was one of the earlier projects that a student group did. Did you look at the Georgia archives? They did, yeah. Oh. But yeah, UGA has special archives too that they've been accessing. Um, so like just today, a student um, came up with um, some images that she took from the UGA archives that show receipts for bricks paid for. And this individual bought a thousand bricks Eight bucks. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, he got a steal there. In 19, it was in 1911, um, which translates to, I think, around $280 a day is what they said. Yeah. Yeah, which I was like, that's, that's so terrible. Good. That's right. yeah. How many students were involved in this? It varies by, uh, by basic semester. Uh, we started with 20. It turned out to be too much. I mean, like, just too many. Uh, for even two of us, because we call instructors class, because it's really intense when it comes to field work. So it's it's fifteen now. The cat, but we were our part is like a piece of butter, and we just let two additional students join the class. So it's seventeen. <laughs> and this is just for UGA students. Yes, it's just for UGA. Is is this a regular course? It is. It is field school one hundred one sort of thing. It, it's not a field school; it's a course, uh, and it's also really important as an experiential learning course. So, what is that? You know, I basically, in order do. for yeah. students yes. to graduate, they gotta have at least a one EL experiential learning course, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, anthropology department cannot offer too many, so it's really <laughs> really important. Yeah. Or, or any basically of the college at college level, really few opportunities occur, and this is one of them, yeah. and it's super important for us. Yeah. It's all, it always feels actually, of course, like a hmm. few minutes. Yep. How many groups are you guys out there with students? Like, do you all go in one group together or is it like kind of split up? Like, it's one group. One group? So yeah, it's, yeah, it's all together. Yeah, it's all together. So, but it's again, it's like two and a half hours okay. a week. So, it is an official course. It's 14, it's 50, course. 60, 60. Yeah. Credit, um, we meet Wednesdays, 9 to 11 30. And, you know, students like it because, you know, just, Different food. Is food? Like, you know, in, yeah. in the woods, yeah. there's some snakes, yeah. you know. And, yeah. You get some that's, that's credits all. for being outside digging. Yeah, eating, <laughs> eating cookies, <laughs> listening to music. Like a you know. okay. <laughs> if you have talk with them, you know, you have it's really it's vegan. unsociable. So that they, and everything. They have, they have, they have one that. vegan. That's, that's my point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's 16 others. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can, can you yeah. want Sorry. to comment on the comparison of the difficulty of the the project program there to yours? Oh, it's they're different though. They're a little different beasties. That's, that's what I'm trying yeah. to say. That, yeah. Uh, this is neat finding something practically on the campus that you can work on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it's like it's a site that could be used forever for oh, this dream. Sure. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. So Where it's like and it's accessible, it's close to the campus, really close to yeah. the campus. Just the park really loves this project. So it's like Our next two hundred years, there's a oh. site where yeah. She was we'll be trained. doing similar kinds of things at U U and G. We've got some ideas about some things that are more accessible on campus. Like this this semester, we're pushing GPR with the um, CRM class out on the promenade. Um, we'll eventually get to Fort Floyd once we have tribal consultation under control and and we're good with tribes. So things are coming down the pipeline. We're not as set up as y'all are, though. I, I I will say that this has been a collaborative effort, not just between. Uh, Sandy Creek Nature Center, um, but with our colleagues too at um, at UGA. Um, so we didn't do the magnetometry, we didn't do the GPR. Yeah. We had colleagues that came out to do it for us, um, and they interpreted it well. They did all of the data processing too, and they were like, "Here are your results," and we were like, "Oh yeah, cool. Maybe something here then." <laughs> That's good. Yeah, yeah. Nothing, wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. And then um, because it's a class, and because we only meet once a week every spring semester. Um, it also is is kind of slow to teach everything, like to teach all how to use the um, different um, uh, like the the total station versus the mapping versus um, all these different techniques and methods that they're learning. It's a slow process, and we only get two and a half hours a, a week. Um, so these excavations, um, you know, students are 
just getting started. And so um, it, it's kind of slow. It's a slow process. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, you actually probably would. see us at Sandy Creek Nature Center. We'd be happy to host you either this Saturday or for backfilling day. Uh, backfilling day on the 17th. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.